The Sheep Pig by Dick King Smith Chapter 8 Omar Fly's suspicions about what the farmer was up to grew rapidly over the next weeks. It soon became obvious to her that he was constructing on his own land a practice course. From the top of the field where the russes had come, the circuit which he laid out ran all around the farm, studded with hazards to be negotiated. Some were existing gateways or gaps, some he made with hurdles or lines of posts between which the sheep had to be driven. Some were extremely difficult. One, for example, a plank bridge over a stream, was so narrow it could only be crossed in single file and the most honeyed words were needed from Babe to persuade the animals to cross. Then, in the horn paddock, Hoggart made a rough shedding ring with a circle of large stones and beyond it a final pen, a small hurdle enclosure no bigger than a tiny room with a gate to close its mouth when he pulled on a rope. Every day the farmer would send Fly to cut out five sheep from the flock and take them to the top of the hill and hold them there. Then, starting Babe from the gate at the lower end of the farmyard, Hoggart would send him away to run them through the course. Away to me, pig, he would say, or come by, pig. And off Babe would scamper as fast as his trotters would carry him as the farmer pulled out his big old pocket watch and noted the time. There was only one problem. His trotters wouldn't carry him all that fast. Here at home, Fly realised, his lack of speed didn't matter much. Whichever five sheep were selected were only too anxious to oblige Babe and would hurry eagerly to do whatever he wanted. But with strange sheep it will be different, thought Fly, if the boss really does intend to run him in a trial. Which it looks as though he does. She watched his tubby, pinky-white shape as he crested the hill. That evening at supper time, she watched again as he tucked into his food. Up till now, it never worried her how much he ate. He's a growing boy, she thought fondly. Now she thought, he's a greedy boy too. Babe, she said, as with a grunt of content he licked the last morsels off the end of his snout. His little tin trough was as shiningly clean as though Mrs. Hoggett had washed it in a sink, and his tummy was tight as a drum. Yes, ma'am. You like being a sheep pig, don't you? Oh, yes, ma'am. And you'd like to be really good at it, wouldn't you? The greatest. Better than any other sheep pig. Do you think there are any others? Well, no. Better than any sheep dog, then. Oh, yes, I'd love to be but I don't really think that's possible. You see, although sheep do seem to go very well for me and, and do what I ask, I mean, do what I tell them, I'm not, nothing like as fast a dog and never would be. No, but you could be a jolly sight faster than you are. How? Well, there are two things you'd have to do, dear, said Fly. First, you'd have to go into proper training. One little run and round a day is not enough. You have to practice hard. Jogging, cross-country running, sprinting, distance work. I'd help you, of course. It all sounded fun to Babe. Great, he said. But you said two things. What's the second? Eat less, said Fly. You'd have to go on a diet. Any ordinary pig would have rebelled at this point. Pigs enjoy eating, and they also enjoy lying around most of the day thinking about eating again. But Babe was no ordinary pig, and he set out enthusiastically to do what Fly suggested. Under her watchful eye, he ate wisely, but not too well, and every afternoon he trained to a programme which she had worked out, trotting right round the boundaries of the farm, perhaps, or running to the top of the hill and back again, or racing up and down the horn paddock. Hoggart thought the pig was just playing, but he couldn't help noticing how he had grown, not fatter, as a sty-kept pig would have done, but stronger and wirier. There was nothing of the piglet about him any more. He looked lean and racy and hard-muscled, and he was now almost as big as the sheep he herded. And the day came when that strength and hardness were to stand him in good stead. One beautiful morning, when the sky was clear and cloudless, and the air so crisp and fresh that you could almost taste it, Babe woke, feeling on top of the world. 
Like a trained athlete, he felt so charged with energy that he simply couldn't keep still. He bounced about the stable floor on all four feet, shaking his head about and uttering a series of short, sharp squeaks. "'You're full of it this morning,' said Fly with a yawn. "'You'd better run to the top of the hill and back to work it off.' "'OK, Mum,' said Babe, and off he shot, while Fly settled comfortably back into the straw. Dashing across the horn paddock, Babe bounded up the hill and looked about for the sheep. Though he knew he would see them later on, he felt so pleased with life that he thought he would like to share that feeling with Ma and all the others before he ran home again. Just to say, hello, good morning everybody, isn't it a lovely day? They were, he knew, in the most distant of all the fields on the farm, right away up at the top of the lane. He looked across, expecting that they would be grazing quietly or lying comfortably and cuddling in the morning sun, only to see them galloping madly in every direction. On the breeze came cries of wolf, but not in the usual bored, almost automatic tones of complaint that they used when fly worked them. These were yells of real terror, desperate calls for help. As he watched, two other animals came in sight, one large, one small, and he heard the sound of barking and yapping as they dashed about after the fleeing sheep. "'You get some wolves as a chase sheep and kill them!' Ma's exact words came back to Babe, and without a second thought he set off as fast as he could in the direction of the noise. What a sight greeted him when he arrived in the far field! The flock, usually so tightly bunched, was scattered everywhere, eyes bulging, mouths open, heads hanging in their evident distress, and it was clear that the dogs had been at their worrying for some time. A few sheep had tried in their terror to jump the wire fencing, and had become caught up in it. Some had fallen into the ditches and got stuck, some were limping as they ran about, and on the grass were lumps of wool torn from others. More dreadful of all, in the middle of the field, the worriers had brought down a ewe, which lay on its side feebly, kicking at them as they growled and tugged at it. On the day when the rustles had come, Babe had felt a mixture of fear and anger. Now he knew nothing but a blind rage, and he charged flat out at the two dogs, grunting and snorting with fury. Nearest to him was a smaller dog, a kind of mongrel terrier, which was snapping at one of the ewe's hind legs, deaf to everything in the excitement of the worry. Before it could move, Babe took it across the back and flung it to one side, and the forces of his rush carried him on into the bigger dog and knocked it flying. This one, a large black crossbred, part collie, part retriever, was made of sterner stuff than the terrier, which was already running dazedly away, and it picked itself up and came snarling back at the pig. Perhaps in the confusion of the moment, it thought that this was just another sheep that had somehow found courage to attack it. But if so, it soon knew better, for as it came on, Babe chopped at it with his terrible pig's bite, the bite that grips and tears, and now it was not sheep's blood that was spilled. Howling in pain, the black dog turned and ran, its tail between its legs. He ran, in fact, for his life, an open-mouthed, bristling pig hard on his heels. The field was clear, and Babe suddenly came back to his senses. He turned and hurried to the fallen ewe, round whom, now the dogs had gone, the horrified flock was beginning to gather in a rough circle. She lay still now, as Babe stood panting by her side, a draggled side where the worries had pulled at it, and suddenly he realised it was Ma. Ma! he cried. Ma! Are you all right? She did not seem too badly hurt. He could not see any gaping wounds, though blood was coming from one ear where the dogs had bitten it. The old ewe opened an eye. Her voice, when she spoke, was as hoarse as ever, but now not much more than a whisper. "'Hello, young un,' she said. Babe dropped his head and gently licked the ear to try and stop the bleeding, and some blood stuck to his snout. "'Can you get up?' he asked. For some time... Ma did not answer, and he looked anxiously at her, but the eye he could still see was open. "'I don't reckon,' she said. "'It's all right, Ma,' Babe said. "'The wolves have gone far away.' "'Far, far, far,' chorused the flock. "'And flying the boss will soon be here to look after you.' Ma made no answer or movement. 
Only her ribs jumped to the thump of her tired old heart. You'll be all right. Honestly, you will, said Babe. Oh, ah, said Ma, and then the eye closed and the ribs jumped no more. Oh, Ma, said Babe, and Ma, 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 mourned the flock as the Land Rover came up the lane. Farmer Hoggett had heard nothing of the worrying. The field was too far away, the wind in the wrong direction, but he had been anxious, and saw by now would fly, because Pig was nowhere to be found. The moment they entered the field, both man and dog could see that something was terribly wrong. Why else was the flock so obviously distressed, panting and gasping and dishevelled? Why had they formed that ragged circle, and what was in the middle of it? Farmer Hoggett strode forward, fly before him parting the ring to make way, only to see a sight that struck horror into the hearts of both. There before them lay a dead ewe, and bending over it was the pig, his snout almost touching the outstretched neck, a snout they saw that was stained with blood.' 